answered. Um, you'll notice in the chat function that the a link to the slides has been provided. Please use that to, to access the slides, but also understand that after the presentation, you'll receive an email from Beryl, which will also link to the slides. So with that, let's get started. We'll go to the first slide. So before we um, dig into the content we have prepared today, we just wanted to take you through our agenda so you know where we're, we're heading during this session. So first we're going to focus on um, the federal level FMLA. Um, we're going to go through the basics of the leave benefit as well as the process associated with FMLA. And then next we're going to pivot and focus on state specific FMLA laws. Um, and today we're going to focus um, especially on Connecticut, Maine and Massachusetts. And finally, we're going to take everything that we've learned um, during today's session and do a quick hypothetical example. So with that, I will hand it back over to Tani to take us through the basics. Okay. So as you'll see on the next slide, we'll go to the next slide, and we're going to talk about the basics of FMLA. We're going to talk about the FMLA process itself. We're gonna talk about one of the places where we most often see employers get tripped up and that's with performance standards and discipline, holding individuals accountable despite um, the need for leave and the Family Medical Leave Act. And then we're gonna talk about the FMLA's relationship to other statutes. So, so that's the basics of what we're gonna talk about as to the federal FMLA before we jump into all the different state laws and rules. So let's jump right into it and get to the next slide. The first thing to be mindful of is under the federal FMLA, um, covered employers are those employers who have 50 or more employees at a single geographic location. If you don't have 50 or more employees at an individual geographic location, you still may be covered by the FMLA if you have 50 or more employees within 75 miles. Now, 75 miles, there's the discussion about, is it 75 miles as the crow flies? Is it using major interstates or roadway? Um, good question. We're gonna do it based off of ability to get from point A to point B. So if it's going over a mountain range and you have to go around it, we're gonna look at 75 miles from, from point A to point B. This becomes a really interesting question with the pandemic though, when we've had employees who are now teleworking and working remotely in different locations. Um, you may have had all of your employees working in one location and now they're working in multiple locations. In that situation, oftentimes the courts are going to look at where their home base is. So who has their home base in Boston, Massachusetts, even though they may be living in Hampton, New Hampshire, they may be living in Concord, New Hampshire, they might be living in Westport, Connecticut during this, right? Where is their home location? And that's how we're gonna decide how many employees are within that 75 mile radius to determine whether or not the FMLA applies. Then I get questions regarding, well, what happens if we have um, changes, fluctuations in, in our 50 employees? And you know, for, for half of last year, we were at 48, but for the last six months, we've been at 50. Um, another really good question. The FMLA is a statute where you're going to want to err on the side of providing leave. The FMLA is a highly, highly technical statute in which it's extremely important that you cross all your T's and dot all your I's. There's specific timeframes in which notices must be provided. And we do not want to find ourselves in a position where we tell an employee, yes, they're eligible for FMLA, but then four or five months later, you attempt to argue that they're no longer eligible because we have less than 50 employees. A court is not going to agree with that argument. So we need to be over encompassing when, when we're dealing with that 50 employee minimum. Next, so if you're a covered employee, if you have those 50 em employer, if you have those 50 or more employees, 
employees would then be entitled to up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. This is one of the times in which employees misunderstand it, thinking that it's 12 weeks of paid leave. It's 12 weeks of unpaid leave. And the only way in which an employee is going to be eligible to receive FMLA is if they have worked for the same employer for at least 12 months. Now those 12 months don't have to be consecutive, it's in total. So if they worked for six months and then they went to another job for a year and then they came back and they've been with you for nine months, that individual has been employed with you for a total of, watch me do the math in my head, right? For 15 months. So you're going to determine that they are covered by the FMLA. So if they've worked for 12 months total, we then have to question whether or not they've worked at least 1,250 hours during the preceding 12 months prior to the day in which they requested leave. So let's go back to that hypothetical I just gave, where the individual worked for six months, then went to another employer and has come back and worked for you for nine months. In that nine month period of time, you're going to have to look through your records to determine whether or not the individuals worked at least 1,250 hours during that period of time. And you're gonna look backwards from the date in which the leave is requested to determine whether or not there's eligibility. Now, oftentimes what we find here is if you have an employee who's doing multiple rounds of FMLA, Depending on how your policies are written, it could be that the employee suddenly is no longer eligible for FMLA because in the preceding 12 month period of time, they didn't work 1250 hours. So, so keep that in mind. The other thing that often trips employers up is that FMLA can be taken on a continuous basis or on an intermittent basis. And later in the presentation, Emily's gonna get into some, some more detail about different types of leave and reasons why people can take leave. But it's important to understand that while a lot of people think of his FMLA leave as a form of parental leave when there's a birth or adoption of a child, there's also the serious health condition provision for individuals who have anxiety, depression, migraines, um, back flare-ups, where it might not be one continuous period of need for leave, but something that occurs and, and flares up um, over the course of a year, a decade, it, it could be a short period of time or a more extensive period of time. So leave can be, and, and that gets us into this next bullet, why leave can be taken. So, so leave can be taken as a result of the employee's own serious health condition, can be taken because of a family member's serious health condition, it can be taken as a result of the birth or placement of a child um, in, in the family's home, or based off of active duty armed forces um, within for the employee or in the employee's family. Now, see how we have serious health condition in, in quotations? Well, why? Why would Emily and Tani do that? Because serious health condition is a defined term. And it's, it's really important to understand that serious health condition is so broad. It's so broad, but it does have reasons or, or ways in which we're going to be able to issue spot it. So one of the biggest things I feel as though you could walk away from this presentation with is the ability to issue spot and say, ooh, this could be a serious health condition and the employee may be entitled to FMLA. Let me dig in a little bit deeper. So a serious health condition is an illness, an injury, an impairment, a condition that could involve inpatient care, or continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. So inpatient care is going to include an overnight stay in a hospital or residential medical facility, any period of incapacity or any subsequent treatment in connection with that overnight stay. And then continuing treatment by a healthcare provider includes um, a period of incapacity of three consecutive full calendar days, and then any subsequent treatment for incapacity that's related to that same condition. 
So an employee who's out of work for three days because of a migraine, right? That's potentially a serious health condition. An employee who goes to rehab for alcoholism, that's a serious health condition. So there's a lot more than just pregnancy and prenatal care that's going to, to fall within this definition. Any incapacity that's due to treatment of a chronic serious health condition, so that could be diabetes, asthma, uh, migraine headaches, a seizure disorder, all of those are going to be considered chronic serious health conditions if they require visits to a healthcare provider at least twice a year, and it's understood that it's going to recur over an extended period of time. Really what I want you to take away from this slide is that a serious health condition is extremely broad and it's going to encompass a whole host of both physical and mental health conditions. Now, if an employee is entitled to FMLA, you must keep in mind that during the course of the period of time in which the employee is out on FMLA leave, you need to maintain the employee's health benefits and other employment related benefits while they're on leave. So there can't be a change in benefits. Now, if the employee normally would pay 40% of their health insurance premium, right? You can still require them to pay that 40% of their health insurance premium. Now, sometimes that becomes difficult if the individual is taking the leave unpaid, and you'll have to have a conversation and dialogue with the employee before the leave starts regarding how they plan to pay for that 40% of the health insurance or, or other benefits during the course of their leave, whether it's by cutting a check, whether it's an agreement that will take it out of future pay. Um, there's a multitude of ways to do it, but you do need to have a dialogue about that. Additionally, if an employee takes FMLA leave, you need to understand that you have an obligation to reinstate them to the position that they held prior to the FMLA leave. Um, or an equivalent position when they return from the FMLA leave, unless the position would no longer exist, even if the individual had not been on FMLA leave. Um, when we're talking about performance management, we're gonna have a couple of hypotheticals that discuss why this is important and things to keep at top of mind. We'll jump to the next slide. So as Tani mentioned, um, the benefit is authorized leave for a period of 12 months. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this from an employer perspective is that employers can select the 12 month period for FMLA at their organizations. And this can be done in a couple different ways and there's a lot to consider um, when making your decision. So the first way um, that you could calculate this FMLA period could be the calendar year. So, um, you know, come January, employees are able to apply for FMLA, assuming they meet the requirements under the statute to be eligible. Um, they have, you know, January to December to use that FMLA, and then the benefit would re-up in January, um, applicable to all employees. Um, another way to do it could be focusing on the employee's anniversary date of hire. Um, so that would be unique to all of your employees, depending on when they started with your organization. Um, at different times of the year. Uh, you could also do the fiscal year. So let's say your fiscal year starts in June, um, the benefit would re-up um, in June in the middle of the year. But the option that we often see um, with employers that are eligible for FMLA is the rolling 12 month period. Um, and the reason for this is it's really the option that's the most advantageous to employers. Um, and under this, option, um, the benefit begins when the employee first requests FMLA. So um, to kind of show how this is helpful to employers, um, I'm going to take you through a quick example. Um, so imagine you have an employee who um, has an approved medical reason why they need to be out um, for FMLA for the 12 weeks in September. So they're out um, September, October, November, returning to the office in December. Um, then let's say that you're utilizing the calendar method um, and then January comes along and something else comes up and the employee now again is out for a consecutive 12 weeks. Um, under the calendar method, they would have their FMLA re-upped and they'd you know, be able to take that extended time. 
Um, whereas under the rolling 12 month period, that employee that initially took their leave in September wouldn't be able to take FMLA leave, FMLA leave again until the following September. So with the rolling 12 month period, you really do get a level of business continuity um, security that it, you know perhaps isn't available under these other um, ways of calculating the 12 month period. Um, so you know there's not necessarily a um, best way to do it out of all of these options, but I do think that that's something to keep in mind um, when you're making that choice for your organization. Um, if we could flip forward to the next slide, please. So next, um, just a quick note on the FMLA process, and we're going to kind of dig into each of these steps um, in greater detail on the subsequent slides. But this is how FMLA um, requests and process work in the workplace. So first, the employee notifies the employer of their need for FMLA. Um, and mind you, this may come in the form of an employee coming to you and saying, you know, hey, I'm having a child, and maybe that employee doesn't know what FMLA is. And as the employer, that would be a situation where you'd say, okay, you know, you're going to be eligible for this benefit. Let me walk you through what that means. Um, the next step would be a medical certification. Now, um, the FMLA doesn't require a medical certification. Um, however, an, employ an employer can require one, and many employers do. Um, and Tani is going to walk us through that in the next slide. Um, and then once the employee is on FMLA, um, the employer really should be continuing to communicate with the employee, even if they're not physically present in the workplace, and maintaining um, good records that document the FMLA leave. Um, this is important for many reasons that we're going to get into in a subsequent slide, um, but really um, it's important as the employer and from the employee expectation standpoint to understand how much leave is available, how much leave has been used, and kind of what's the plan to return to work if that's an option that's available to the employee. Finally, um, just something that I wanted to note that's important to remember throughout this process, especially during the request phase, is from an employee standpoint, there's no ability for them to choose to not have FMLA apply. Um, if they have a something going on in their life that is eligible, like the birth of a child or a serious um, health condition, it is covered by the FMLA. So, um, you know, if you ever find yourself in a situation where an employee is saying, you know, oh, I don't want to kind of get into the whole FMLA thing, um, that's not really an option that's available to them. Um, in some workplaces, there are policies where if the FMLA benefit is unpaid, employees may say, you know, I, I don't want to be unpaid for that day. I'd prefer to use a vacation day and kind of still have coverage under the FMLA. Um, and that's a little bit of a different, more complex situation that we can talk through, but they, they aren't able to just say they don't want to be covered by the FMLA. That's, you know, not how it, how it works under the statute. Um, if we could, oh, oh sorry, Tony. So, no, what Emily's mentioning becomes extremely important when you're dealing with a difficult employee. Oftentimes, employees seem to believe that FMLA is something bad, that it's not there to help them. And, and that's the, the way in which communication becomes really important. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But explaining what FMLA is, that it's a benefit to them, that it protects their job while, while they need to take this leave. Um, there are significant misnomers out there regarding what this leave is and a lot of employees feel as though it's bad or that they're going to be looked down upon for taking this leave when in fact not only do we as an employer have the obligation to provide it but that employees are required to take the leave if they qualify for it so you don't get to pick and choose this type of leave. Now, one of the aspects of the FMLA that makes it more difficult than some of the other employer-employee relationship type um, issues that you'll deal with is that there are very specific rules about what information we can and cannot have. So as an employer, you can request and assess a medical certification from the employee. And Emily is going to get into what that certification looks like and the information. But specifically, you're going to provide a form to the employer, em employee. They're going to give it to their medical provider, and their medical provider is going to complete it. When you receive that piece of paper back, you're going to take a look at it. And it's going to have so many vague things on it. And you're going to say, 
yeah, but what, what's the condition or why do they need to be out on leave for this period of time? Um, the problem becomes is that under the Family Medical Leave Act, you're only allowed to go back and ask the medical provider questions for two reasons. And, and that's that the information itself is vague or it's ambiguous. Now, ambiguous seems like it would be, well, if you don't understand it, that means I can go back to the medical provider, right? Ambiguous from an FMLA standpoint means that you can't understand the medical provider's handwriting. So if you're reviewing the documentation and you can't understand some of the handwriting, that's the only way in which you can go back to the medical provider and ask them to clarify the information. As to vagueness, that would only happen if the medical provider failed to complete a portion of the documentation. So the documentation it is pretty extensive as to the information that is sought and requested from the medical provider. Oftentimes the medical provider will skip over um, portions of the form because they feel as though it's inapplicable to the current situation. The problem is, is that, that maybe it is, but we don't know that if it's been skipped. So you can go back to, to the doctor and you can request that information. Now, as it relates to the authenticity of the medical certification, oftentimes we'll have employers who say, I don't trust this employee. And I think that they know this medical provider and the medical provider really just did exactly what the employee asked them to do, right? There is a chance that that, that is the truth, right? Um, and that the medical provider does just kind of sign off on any FMLA leave paperwork that's put in front of them. I don't think that's the majority of the cases, but does it happen sometimes? Yes, it happens sometimes. So from an authenticity standpoint, right, you can't go back to that doctor unless you can't tell who the doctor is. Sometimes the signature is so difficult to read and understand. Um, or you can't find the provider. So oftentimes what I'll do when an, a client sends FMLA paperwork to me is I, I Google to see if I can find who the provider is to make sure it's in the same geographic region. Now, you do have the ability to request second or third opinions, but, but you have to have reasoning to be, to be able to do that. And if you are in a position in which you're going to ask for additional opinions, you're going to have to do it at your own cost. And you're going to have to be very careful because an employee can say that you're interfering with their right to take FMLA leave if you're treating them different from other employees. So I highly recommend that if you're considering getting multiple opinions on an FMLA form, that you bring in counsel to help navigate you through the process. Now for employees who have intermittent needs for leave, so anxiety, depression, asthma, um, migraines, you cannot ask for new paperwork every single time in which the employee goes out for leave. Um, you can only request recertification every six months unless there is something that has happened that changes what's in the certification. So if the certification says that the employee will likely need to be out of work two days a month as a result of migraines, and over the course of the last month, the employee has been out 14 days, right? So significantly more than what's set forth. You can then request a recertification and you can write a letter to the doctor saying, this is the absences that we're seeing at this point in time. Does this correlate to, to what the condition is? So you can have that dialogue with the doctor at that point, but you have to wait for it to occur. Oftentimes employees wanna do it beforehand, we have to unfortunately wait until um, the event has occurred. Otherwise, if, if it's not an intermittent leave issue, um, which is every six months, you can request recertification every 30 days 
Um, oftentimes, however, once you have the information related to the condition, if there's not a, ch a change in the conditions or what you're seeing in the work environment, and it's not intermittent, you oftentimes are not going to need to receive recertification. One of the key and most important aspects, especially for smaller businesses, is that you need to keep the employee's direct supervisor out of the chain of, of command. So that individual cannot, um, cannot learn about um, the, the condition itself, the underlying health condition. HR should tell the manager why um, or that the employee is going to be out of work, but not the specific condition. So we need to keep the direct supervisor out of any communications with the healthcare provider and just update them on need for leave. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. So one of them is, so if you have someone who's currently using FMLA intermittently for a heart condition since November, and the employee is out for FMLA block leave due to a broken ankle that will need surgery. However, the reason the injury happened is due to the heart conditioning condition causing the employee's blood pressure to quickly drop, causing a fainting spell that caused a fall. Does this stay as part of the first FMLA concerning the um, heart condition? So I would say no, I'd say you have two serious health conditions there because you've now got the broken ankle as well as the heart condition. And while the broken ankle is indirectly related to the, the heart condition, it is a separate and distinct um, condition. So best practices would be to do a second form concerning the um, FMLA need for leave related to the, the broken ankle. However, if the time in which the individual is out for the heart condition is going to be similar or simultaneous to the broken ankle, um, it might be duplicative. But what you are going to want to do is start having a dialogue with that employee under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're going to get into that later in the presentation. But more likely, there's going to be different accommodations you may need to provide to the employee as a result of that broken ankle. So it is two separate and distinct um, health conditions. So you should have paperwork regarding if there's multiple health conditions, you should have different paperwork for each of those conditions to identify how much leave may be needed for it. Um, one of the other questions we've received, some of our employees have complained that their healthcare provider is charging them to complete the certification form. Is that legal? My understanding is that that is not legal, that they, they need to um, complete the form. Um, so I would indicate to the, the individual that their health care provider should not be charging them if they don't have a primary care physician, but they're using some place like Concentra or walk-in clinic, that may be different. Um, but, but my understanding is, is no, they shouldn't be charged for, um, for the certification to be completed. And then... Okay, uh, so those were the two, the two questions we have. And now we're gonna jump to the next slide. And this is the first document. So remember at the beginning of the presentation, Emily and I said, cross all your T's, dot all your I's. One of the big things is paperwork. So if you're not an organized person, this is going to force you to really create a system. I know some employers who use a spreadsheet where they keep track of dates in which documents are due, what documents they've received from employees, what days the employee is taken off that are FMLA eligible versus not eligible. But for each individual, you need to um, you know, be mindful that you're meeting all of these requirements. So the first thing is you need to provide your employee with a document that's called eligibility notice and rights and responsibilities. We've provided where that document can be located right here. We're not going to link to it, but take a look at this document and, and recall two things specifically. One, um, last year, all the years prior to that, this document used to be two documents. Go through your system and make sure that you're not using old documents because you need to be using the most updated documents. And they've now taken this eligibility notice and the rights and responsibilities, 
merged it into one document, okay? This document, you as the employer are gonna complete the whole entire thing. So there's four specific sections and you're going to provide, you're going to fill all of it in and you're not going to get anything back from the employee. So you're gonna fill in the general information, you're gonna fill in notice of eligibility, additional information that may be needed and then notice of rights and responsibilities. So you're completely um, in charge of completing that document. Um, so a question, if you have an employee that seems to be provider shopping or going to a few different doctors to receive different outcomes for an extended return to work date, can you request the employer to see your company physician to validate authenticity? Yes, I mean, and you can have return to work requirements or fitness for duty requirements as long as you do it across the board. So we need to be careful to make sure that we're not treating one individual more harshly than and other individuals, but if you have information where you're seeing um, a return to work that's different from the doctor who um, completed the FMLA forms, that's going to be a reason why you're questioning kind of not just authenticity, but, but the information you're receiving and how genuine it is. So that would be a situation in which, um, you know, you should work with counsel um, because it sounds like a provider shopper is someone you should get counsel involved in, in early on in the discussion to make sure that you don't have any missteps. But yes, you, you could have your own um, provider if you're doing it at your own cost, um, complete the return to work documentation. Um, another question we have is if you have an employee that, oh, okay, we've got that one. Um, so the next question is, and this is related to the notice of rights and responsibilities, and it seems Tanya is familiar with the documentation, which is actually going to be relevant to our next slide that Emily is going to discuss. So we'll go to the next slide, and our pending question relates to this certification of healthcare provider. Great. So um, taking a look at the certification of healthcare provider, there are two forms that are relevant here, um, and it depends on the reason for the leave. So the first one is for the employee's own serious health condition. Um, on this for form, the employer completes section one, and the employee's healthcare provider will complete section two. And we have both of these documents linked here um, for you all as well, so do take a look at them. Um, and then for the family member's serious health condition, this uh, form is largely the same. Um, the only difference here is that the section two is completed by the employee. Um, and in this section, the employee really is um, denoting the relationship um, to the family member that has the serious health condition so that you can ensure that it's um, covered by FMLA. Um, and then like the employee's own serious health condition form, the employer completes section one and the employee's family member's healthcare provider completes the new section three. So Emily, we have a question and that is, so on this certification of healthcare provider, there's gonna be a timeline for completion of the documents. And the question is, if it's gone past the minimum 15 days for the medical certification to be received, so you indicate on the form, you have 15 days and you should return this form to the company by X, Y, and Z date. So X, Y, and Z comes and goes and we don't have the medical certification. How much extra time do you give to get this back to make a determination or designation as to whether or not it's FMLA qualifying? So, you know, I think, it, unfortunately, the answer to this question is kind of situationally dependent. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, depending on what the person is kind of going through um, in their request, I always kind of think of like the newspaper test, you know, like, is it, I don't know that I would call them on day 16 and say, you know, we're not going to take it anymore, you know, move, move along. Um, I think it would be worth a check in with the employee to understand, you know, kind of what's, what's the deal, what's going on, and then set a deadline to try to get that information back from them. Great points, Emily. And I mean, one of the things that we see often is if an individual is in rehab and mm -hmm. doesn't have technology access, if an individual's mental state is such that they actually can't comprehend information um, or, or completion of kind of some of these administrative things, in those situations, we often 
recommend that HR say to the employee, is there another family member who you'd feel comfortable with having in the room when we have some of these discussions so that they can help you kind of moving forward because these, this paperwork is important. And additionally, you know, we run into problems when, when we think that the employee is being untruthful. So mm -hmm. if, if we don't have anything at all, if we don't have a doctor's note or any other documentation to show that there is a health condition, um, you know, I, I don't have a problem with on day 18, when you're not hearing from the employee, they're not responding to emails, you don't have anything to document the need for leave to say, you know, we haven't received any of the paperwork. The time you've taken to date is not going to qualify for FMLA leave. As a result, you know, if, if you don't return to work on X, Y, and Z date, we'll be we'll consider it a resignation of the position. Oftentimes, when we say something to that effect, the employee starts responding, and at that point in time, try to re-engage it and give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's go to that next slide for Emily. Great, so the next form is the designation notice and this form is filled out completely by the employer. Um, section one is gonna go through the basics of the request, um, whether or not the leave is approved or not approved. Um, section two is a section you would fill out if additional information is needed, um, including what Tani discussed earlier concerning the certification of a second or a third medical opinion. Um, and finally, section three it contains detailed about the approved FMLA request. So this is where you're gonna write down if the leave is paid, what are the return to work requirements, um, et cetera. And we have that form linked there as well for you all too. Um, so I think flipping ahead to the next slide, we're gonna go through clarifying the certification. So we discussed this briefly, but um, it's important to remember that FMLA does not live in a vacuum. So recall earlier, I said, there's gonna be limited ways in which we can communicate and find out more information, at least under the FMLA. However, under um, the Americans with Disabilities Act or workers' compensation rules, we may have other avenues in which we can garner information. If the individual is requesting intermittent leave in some format, um, providing ADA request for accommodation forms oftentimes is helpful for the employer to get a better sense as to whether or not there are other accommodations that are going to be need, needed to be made at work. Also for individuals who are seeking intermittent leave, if it's for doctor's appointments, um, we can have a dialogue with the employee to make sure that they're scheduling it at times that are more convenient um, for us. So oftentimes one of the, the big problems that, that I hear about is, okay, we have somebody in accounts payable who does our payroll and every Thursday when payroll is due, that's the day that they take they take off or they schedule their doctor's appointments for. That's something that we're gonna have a dialogue about. If they always are getting sick on Thursdays, we might have to change um, their job duties and responsibilities while they're on the intermittent FMLA leave so that you know they're not doing payroll and it's not holding up other um, aspects of our functionality. So we can, and, and this is something we discussed a little bit earlier, we can verify healthcare provider completed the documentation and clarify handwriting. We cannot allow a supervisor or manager to contact the healthcare provider. And we can't seek information from the healthcare provider that isn't requested under the FMLA. But recall that we can do it under workers' compensation and ADA, but we have to be very, very clear that that is how we are seeking the information. Additionally, one of the things we run into oftentimes is we let workers' compensation take over the process. Now recall that the purpose of workers' compensation is they're trying to push an employee to get back to work in as much of a capacity as possible. Under the FMLA, however, the employee may be entitled to, to extended periods of leave. So even if the workers' compensation process is going on, if the employee is out of work, um, you need to be completing FMLA paperwork for that individual. Let's jump to that next slide. Communication is key. 
um, as it is with, with everything, communication in the FMLA process is even more key. Um, you're dealing with an individual who likely is juggling a lot of different things, whether it's their own health condition, the health condition of another person, that adds a layer of intricacy to everything. I most often recommend that if you have a conversation or a dialogue with an employee by phone, you need to follow up immediately in writing and explain what you just agreed on, what the timelines are, so that they have multiple avenues in which they can understand what your expectations are. So often clients come to me and say, well, we talked on this day and I said this, and I said, well, if they say that didn't happen, do we have any proof? No. Okay, so make sure you follow up all of your oral communications in writing. Oftentimes people will say, I can't even get the employee on the phone. I've been calling and leaving messages and they're not responding. Text message, email, I know that sounds unconventional, but in today's day and age with the demographics that are entering the workforce, sometimes text messaging is the only way that we can get employees to respond and we need to stay in touch with them. For individuals who are on extended leaves, making sure that we're clear as to how long we want them to check in with us is, is important. So if an individual is out on leave for anxiety or depression, um, and it's been 10 weeks and we haven't heard anything about when they plan to return to work, we need to be reaching out and saying, hey, you have two weeks left of leave, kind of what's your current status? Um, even before we get to leave 10, I would love for us to set up a process where every three weeks we're asking them just to check in, let them know how they're doing, let us know how they're doing and keep us updated on their status and a potential return to work date. For individuals who are seeking more intermittent leave, recognize that you can still hold them to the same standards regarding timeliness of calling out that they're going to be out of work or coming in late due to the condition. Um, so being clear with regards to the expectations is important and you, you need to be prepared to go the extra step before terminating for non-compliance. And this is similar to the question that was posed about if it's been 15 days and we haven't heard from them, what should we do? And as we talk about communication with the employee, let's jump to record keeping and discuss why that's so important. So record keeping, um, especially as it relates to time records um, for employees is incredibly important under the FMLA. Um, as you would imagine, you know, this really becomes an issue when you're talking about intermittent leave requests. Um, if it's continuous, it's fairly straightforward. If someone's out for 12 weeks, they're not physically, you know, on their laptop or coming into work. Um, but where it gets tough with intermittent FMLA is in the same time span that someone could be utilizing that benefit, they might also be going on vacation or having sick days or what have you. Um, so it really becomes necessary for the supervisor or who, for whoever is responsible for um, timekeeping for those employees to make sure that they understand, you know, if an employee is out for the afternoon, what is that time and making sure that it's recorded promptly and accurately. Um, this can get kind of tricky, you know, we're all in the kind of busyness of our days and someone, you know, just says that they're going to be out, but it's really important to follow up with that question so that we maintain an accurate record of how much FMLA time has been used and how much FMLA time is remaining on that request. Um, something that you could consider doing here, um, you know, depending on your timekeeping system and if it makes sense for your organization, could be when an employee utilizes FMLA, you know, perhaps they um, noted in the system and send a note to HR or something like that. So there's kind of like a, another mechanism that's tracking that usage. Um, it's incredibly important and it's way better ahead of time to kind of know how that time's all being accounted for rather than trying to figure it out later because um, that will just get frustrating and confusing for, for everyone involved. Um, there's also, um, for record keeping, um, an exemption under the FMLA for salaried exempt employees. Um, so for exempt employees under the FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, who take intermittent or reduced schedule leave, employers are able to dock their pay for the hours that they are on FMLA leave without affecting their exempt status. Um, now, state law may impose greater restrictions on this practice. 
Um, but to help preserve this exemption, the employer and the employee should sign a document um, agreeing on the employee's average hours um, worked per week and um, maintain that record in the employee's file, just in case that is something that um, you are interested in kind of doing as the arrangement goes on. Um, we spoke briefly about the sick vacation time and you know how that can kind of get conflated with um, the FMLA time if it's an intermittent basis. But um, to the point that we made earlier um, in addressing multiple FMLA leaves, um, where possible, um, you know, and it's a little tricky if it is something that's kind of happening at the same time, um, with a new request um, comes new documentation. So even if you have a prior document in the file from a medical provider, it's a best practice to make sure that the um, documents are all up to date, that the dates reflect the dates of the leave, um, just so that you kind of have all your ducks in a row about what's happening and how much time has been used. Um, and we'll flip forward and focus next on performance standards. So this is most often where we hear from employers and this is where things start to fall apart. And usually we see it from an intermittent basis. So less so when, when we're dealing with long gaps of time in which an employee is out on FMLA leave. So it, it may seem like, okay, well, if the employee is supposed to have documents filed on March 20th, but they're out of work from January, First to March 31st, of course, we don't expect that, that those documents will be filed on March 20th and we need to figure out another thing to do because we can't require the individual to be working during their FMLA leave. Um, at the same time, however, if it's an intermittent leave, we can still require that the individual or the employee is courteous, is mindful, is timely completing work. But we can't expect that while they're taking that leave that they're going to be accomplishing the same amount of work that they were accomplishing before the leave. So if they're working an 80% schedule and they're taking um, so let's say that, that they're taking five hours off every week of FMLA, right? Um, okay, we need to decrease what, what our expectations are by that um, five hours. So, so we can't expect the same amount of work to be accomplished in a shorter period of time. This is most often easiest to track when we have very specific production standards or sales quota. Um, it, it's easy to change that. It's more difficult for employees who don't have strong job descriptions that set forth expectations or when they have employees who their job has expanded over the course of, of their time there. Um, it's important to be really clear at the beginning of an FMLA leave what the job duties and responsibilities are and get an understanding as to how those other duties are going to be covered while the employee's out. I mean, if the employee goes out on FMLA leave and you haven't had a dialogue about who's going to cover certain aspects of their job when they're out, then we likely have a larger kind of organizational concern because the individual either wasn't doing anything, right? So you don't have a concern about who's going to be doing that or you don't have an idea of what the employee was doing and a bunch of things are gonna fall through cracks when, when they're out. Let's jump to that next slide upon discipline. So it's illegal to hold against employees the fact that they exercise their rights under the FMLA, um, but it's also important to note that it's not illegal to fire, reassign, demote, or discipline employees for reasons that are unrelated to their use of FMLA. Um, and like many of the topics that we've talked about this morning, it really comes it comes down to a question of proof, which you know goes back to making sure that you're documenting your communications, record keeping, all of that stuff. Um, so you know, it, it, I think that it, you can envision an example where someone has an FMLA request, but there's also all this other stuff that's that's happening. Um, and as an organization, you need to address that behavior. Um, so you know, we'd like to kind of include this as an example to show the importance of all of the the small things that you do dur throughout the duration of the FMLA request, so that you can um, manage your organization effectively and stay protected. If, in case you needed to go in front of a decision maker, a court, or a judge, and and talk about why you made the decision that you did. 
One of the things we most often see from this standpoint is that somebody's taken over the job and you now have a realization that the employee who's out on FMLA leave was doing a horrible job, wasn't doing anything at all, something along those lines. That's really problematic because it's directly tied to the FMLA leave. So you're going to have to bring the employee back and, and then you're going to have to start performance management because you weren't performance managing appropriately before the leave. So you're gonna have to bring them back and then begin working through that performance management, you're not just going to be able to get rid of them or not have them return. Let's jump to the relationship with other statutes. We've talked briefly about workers' compensation and the ADA, which are two of the most common. You'll notice, however, when you're completing the forms that we've linked to, that GINA, or the Genetic Information um, Non-Discrimination Act, also plays a role. Do not ask for more information than is set forth on the forms, because if you do, you're going to likely be wading into um, a potential nightmare with regards to, to GINA. Now let's jump. We have a, a little under 10 minutes, but we're going to quickly run through the state FMLA issues. So there are a lot of changes coming to Connecticut FMLA in 2022. Um, Connecticut is actually moving to a paid FMLA benefit, which will apply to all private employers. Um, it, it will grant up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period for all leave reasons. Um, and something I did wanna point out here as well is that it does provide for job protection after three months of employment. Um, so a, a little bit different than the federal law. Um, and if you are an employer that does business in Connecticut, it's also important to note that a lot of notice requirements are gonna be kicking in in 2022 um, for new employees as well as existing employees and annual notice to them regarding that benefit. Um, we can flip ahead to Maine. So under Maine law, it, it's still an unpaid leave benefit. So it's different from what will be in effect in Connecticut and what's in effect in Massachusetts. It, however, applies to smaller employers. So it applies to employers who have 15 or more employees. But there is some slight modifications to the employee. So employees who have worked 12 consecutive months, which is different from the 12 months total, are entitled to take up to 10 work weeks of family medical leave in a two year period. So in a 24 month period, they're entitled to 10 weeks of leave unpaid. Um, and that's for employers with 15 or more employees. So it's a lot less than under the Federal Family Medical Leave Act. So if you're a main employer and you're jumping around that, you know, 48, 52 employees, recall that the main FMLA leave is going to be applicable um, either way. So you're going to have that obligation. Additionally, this year we saw a legislative update. Um, to the um, Maine Family Medical Leave Act, which will take effect at the end of the summer. And it now has amended the statute to allow grandparents to take family medical leave in order to care for grandchildren who have a serious health condition. This is more expansive than what's permitted under the Federal Family Medical Leave Act. So keep that in mind as well. Let's jump to Massachusetts. So for those operating in Massachusetts with HOPE, you're already aware of this because it went into effect on January 1st of 2021, where you're going to um, make sure that employees have um, accessibility to, to paid leave. Now, the good news is, is that you as the employer don't determine whether or not an employee is qualified for leave. Instead, you're going to help them complete the paperwork is going to be sent to the main uh, the Massachusetts paid um, medical leave act department and they're going to help complete the documentation but to help employees understand whether or not they're eligible they need to have earned at least 5400 during the last four calendar quarters um, and at least 26 times the eligible weekly benefit amount in order to be eligible. All private sector employers are covered. We're looking at 12 weeks of job protected family paid leave and up to 20 weeks of job protected um, paid medical leave or up to 26 weeks of combined family and medical leave um, in a benefit year. So it's significantly more than what's provided under um, the federal 
Family Medical Leave Act, because if you had multiple situations, you still only give 12 weeks. In Massachusetts, however, you get up to 26 weeks, depending on the reasons. Um, are there forms for state FMLA to give employees? So in Maine, no. What we recommend in Maine is for you to use the federal forms because the, the statutes are parallel. If you email me offline, I also have created some Maine ones um, that I can provide you. So anyone who'd like to have those Maine forms, um, I can provide to you, but the Maine statute itself doesn't create or provide any of those forms. Um, let's jump to our hypothetical because we only have four minutes left. Emily, why don't you run through that? Sure. So um, I'm just going to read this out and then we'll kind of go through um, everything we learned today. So your company, which is for everyone, has 75 employees in its Biddeford, Maine headquarters. Sally comes to you and complains that her boss, Robbie, is hostile and is causing her extreme stress and anxiety to the point that she had to take all of last week off because she felt so sick to her stomach at the thought of coming into work and seeing him. She said that she's talked to her therapist and is trying to work on ways to process some of the past trauma that Robbie is bringing to the surface, but to date has been unsuccessful. All right. So I think for a lot of um, the people out there, the first thing that jumps out is this hostile. Okay, she's just um, complained that Robbie's hostile. So we have this hostile work environment claim that we need to investigate. But recall that we have a whole bunch of other leave issues that are coming up here. So first, we know that Widgets for Everyone has 75 employees. Um, so FMLA is going to apply. Now, we don't know whether or not Sally's been employed for at least a year and worked 1,250 hours. Let's presume, however, that she has. Is the extreme stress and anxiety that, that she's complaining about, is that um, itself a serious health condition? Well, probably, at least um, based off of the information we have, because we know that last week she took the whole week off right? Because that anxiety and stress was making her sick to her stomach, so she didn't come into work. So she's taken at least three days off. We're going to want to give her the certification, the medical certification to see, does she have a doctor? Is she just generally saying she has anxiety and dis, um, depression um, and stress, or is there um, a medical certification? Additionally, Robbie's her boss and she's saying Robbie's causing it. So we also have a workers compensation claim here. So we're gonna to need to make a first report of injury to our workers comp provider. Will it be covered? Probably not. We know that the stress claims often are denied, but at the same time, best um, practices would be to make the report. Um, she says she has a therapist. We don't know if the therapist is going to qualify as a medical provider, but the medical provider is a very broad definition, so most likely they will. Um, additionally, is the stress and anxiety going to be considered a disability in which we're going to have to have a reasonable accommodation dialogue to determine whether or not, in addition to leave, there's other things we need to be doing at work to help her kind of continue to work despite this disability. Is there someone other than Robbie who she can report to? If not, is Robbie the only person um, available for her to report to? And we're gonna have that general reasonable accommodation dialogue under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But here, we most definitely wanna provide FMLA paperwork we want to have a discussion with our workers' comp provider, and we also need to um, make sure that, that we have the ADA um, reasonable accommodation dialogue. And on top of that, we have to investigate whether or not Robbie's really hostile. So we have this general complaint that we're going to have to investigate and find out why is she saying that, what does she mean? Um, I mean, I'm getting anxious just thinking about all the things that we have to do with this very um, brief hypothetical. Emily, anything to add to that? Um, I guess one kind of question. So let's say that Sally goes and she gets the medical certification. It looks all good. Um, can FMLA cover the time that she was out leading up to it? 
Yes, it absolutely could because we she's indicated that the time that she was out was time directly related to this condition. So if we move forward and we find out that she is um, eligible for FMLA, she completes all the right documentation, then yes, we could have this be covered under the FMLA. Now we have one question regarding um, New Hampshire and whether or not New Hampshire has FMLA leave. New Hampshire itself does not have an independent FMLA statute. Recall that you may have obligations under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, if you have under 500 employees and you're choosing, recall right now that you don't have to, but you could choose to apply it. They also have, um, a statute that requires that employers with at least six employees um, provide leave for pregnancy and childbirth. So an individual can request leave for um, a period due to um, physical disability that results from pregnancy or childbirth or related medical condition. So no general FMLA, but FFCRA could apply as well as the pregnancy and childbirth statute. Um, we have another question. How about the COVID ARPA family leave being offered? How does that play into all of this? Doctor recommendation to quarantine due to a medical condition. Yeah, you still should be providing FMLA paperwork or documentation. They didn't create any new or updated FFCRA forms for this. If you have under 500 employees and you're choosing to move forward and continue to provide um, FFCRA leave, um, related to COVID or COVID vaccinations or any um, need to stay home for childcare requirements due to the closing of a facility or school for COVID related reasons, um, you should still continue to have um, FMLA paperwork provided. If, however, they're quarantined um, due to a state order, I mean, you're, you're not going to have the, the doctors no, I would additionally provide that employees have more time to complete documentation at this period of time because we know that most medical providers are very busy right now also dealing with COVID. Um, are employers required to retro dates for intermittent leave requests? It depends. I know that's a horrible answer. It's the one that no one wants to hear from their attorney, but it really does depend on the situation. You can't find yourself in a situation in which you have provided less leave than the employee is entitled to or that you've interfered with the leave. But if at the time in which a leave was taken, it was clear that it's related to the certified um, health condition that, that you now have documentation regarding, I would have a dialogue with that employee and say, you know, your FMLA is going to begin on this date, the first date that you took leave regarding the condition, and this is how much leave you have remaining at, at this point in time. I wouldn't be looking back six months, eight months. I mean, I would look back a couple of weeks, maybe two months. More than that, though, I, I, I think it becomes very high risk to do that. Um, another question, in Massachusetts, if a person is eligible for short-term disability, must they also complete the state FMLA? Do they have a choice? They should. I, I mean, if you're providing short-term disability as an employer, that's, real, that's great. Um, but you also should have them completing FMLA paperwork with the state. The reason being is you don't know how long the disability is going to go for. The FMLA um, will account for the short-term disability that's being received by the employee. But the last thing you want to do is find yourself in a situation where short-term disability is expired, but you haven't started the FMLA process. Um, it's better that they're running concurrently with each other. And then if one um, goes longer than expected, then you can either move to long-term disability or you can continue to have FMLA coverage. So a lot of times people say, well, it seems like overkill and they're already overwhelmed getting all these paperwork. Um, I mean, in worst case scenario, you just don't want to find yourself in a position where you haven't had the two run concurrently and you have an employee out for, you know, for 30 something weeks as opposed to, to 26 or 12, depending on the type of coverage you have. Um, Thank you all for your attention. We really appreciate um, you all being present and, and such active questions. 
we're available. You see our, our emails down below. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and thank you so much.